Good morning. Welcome to Bible Study. Today I'm Evan Gertner and I am recording this Bible study in advance uh, because I am traveling on Sunday to uh, Concordia University in Nebraska, in Seward, Nebraska, to give my son Henry a chance to see that campus and determine if that's maybe a place he wants to go. So um, I'm going to try to lead the Bible study in kind of the same interactive way, talking about a question of the day, leading through the study, just as if I was doing it live. Um, but this will be uh, recorded, um, and it'll give me a chance. I wonder if during the Bible study I might try to follow along in the Facebook comments and, and, and be interactive that way, in a way I can't be when I'm actually teaching it. Uh, we'll start with a word of prayer. And uh, for this prayer, I'm using a book, uh, the Lutheran Book of Prayer, and this is a prayer uh, for Epiphany. Uh, that's the season that we are concluding today, uh, this day, the Transfiguration of our Lord. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We have service at 6.30 p.m., which will also be live streamed. Um, and then Lent begins. Return to the Lord is our Lent theme for all the services this uh Midweek services during Lent, we'll have Ash Wednesday, and then the following Wednesdays throughout Lent, we'll have also uh, services at 6.30 p.m. We start. O Almighty and everlasting God, you manifested your Son, Jesus Christ, to the wise men of the East as the light to lighten the Gentiles. You have made your only begotten Son to be both the glory of your people Israel and the light to lighten the Gentiles. You have prepared your salvation for all people. You have established your church on earth as the keeper and dispenser of the means of grace, that your kingdom might come to all men, and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I boldly ask that I be so endued with your Holy Spirit, that my joy in the Anointed One would increase, that I may give glory to you, that by all I say and do I may freely confess your mercies among unbelievers. Let your church shine as holy Zion, that the Gentiles may come to her light, and nations to the brightness of her rising, that they with us and the whole host of heaven may praise you in your most holy name, live forever in your presence and light and glory, everlasting, through your dear Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The question for the day is uh, from my comfy chair stack of questions, and uh, this one is going to be the easy question on this one. Uh, so every card has a comfy chair, a rocking chair, and then kind of like an old, uncomfortable wooden chair. And the easy question on this one is, what is your favorite room in your house and why? What is your favorite room in your house and why? Uh, you know, I suppose it depends on the time of day. But one of the favorite rooms that I have in our house is our living room where myself, my kids, my wife, we can all kind of just sit on the couch. We catch up on what's going on today, uh, what's gone, uh, what's ahead. And then we, we uh, all sit and we'll watch a show, a movie, something together. Uh, we put our phones away, try not to have any screens uh, besides the common show we're watching together. And, and let that be something that kind of helps us bring a close to the day and so I, I'd say that that living room, that space where we kind of all come from our separate spaces and meet there. That's a good one. I like our kitchen too. I really enjoy cooking. And uh, the kitchen in our house is something we renovated when we move here. And it is uh, an easy space to work in. So I like the kitchen as well. The Bible study sheet for today is the same one from last week, uh, lesson 54. It's found on our website at ourshepherd.net. Uh, to the far right, there's a tab called Resources. You go down the menu to News, and you click on that, and there on News is all of our um, documents that we put up on our website, including the Weekend's Bulletin, uh, the Notes and News that's published once a month, the Just Pray that has all of our prayer requests for the week, and uh, baptism birthdays, birthdays, and Bible studies. So look for Lesson 54 in the Matthew Bible Study there. Uh, we didn't finish it last week. Last week we got through uh, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Uh, and we were, the Bible study got cut off around the 23rd minute. Uh, the program that I use to record and to stream out to Facebook and YouTube and our church website crashed. It was annoying. 
Um, sometimes when that happens, it seems to happen about once every couple months. Um, it often happens right near the end of Bible study. I'm kind of like, you know what, the amount of time it takes to get the Bible study back up and going, not worth it. But this was about 1020, 1023. I thought, all right, we still have seven minutes. Finally got it started again about 1026. Had about three minutes of Bible study left and then we were done. I try to end at 1030 so that people who are trying to travel to church to attend the 11 o'clock service have time to be a part of the whole Bible study and then yet still get to class and to get to worship. Um, so Matthew chapter 23, that's what we're looking at right now. I'm pulling it up in the split screen and uh, we have a chance to see that Jesus is warning the crowds and the disciples to not follow after blind guides that don't know where they're going. Um, because these guides, the Pharisees and the scribes, these guides are leading people to whatever keeps these people in power. Uh, and he makes reference to how they love the places of honor at feasts in verse 6, or greetings in the marketplaces, verse 7, or their titles in verses 8, 9, and 10. Those who lead you in such a way that helps keep them in the security of their own power are leading you towards a path that keeps you subservient and keeps them in power. That's what Jesus is pointing out about the scribes and the Pharisees. Verse 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is kind of that reminder that the one who is leading you so that he looks important is only leading you so he stays important. Jesus becomes a servant so that you may be exalted. Uh, the next thing we have is a series of woe statements, W-O-E, woe. And we're going to look now at verses 13 through 33, and we'll do it in kind of small chunks to keep track of what's going on in each of these warnings. We'll start by just reading the whole text that's in Matthew chapter 13, starting um, chap I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 23, starting at verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for who shut the kingdom of heaven in people's for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's <laughs> you know, I need to just start over. I was trying to read ahead and get ready, but all right. Verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You neither enter yourselves nor allow those who enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple... He is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees. Uh, you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are also sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. And so oh, we're going to end at verse 33. All right. So 
lots of woes, lots of bad things going on there. Uh, what we're going to do now is go in our study sheet and look a little bit slower at each of these. Uh, so starting uh, in verses uh, 13 and 15, what theme do these woes share? So let's look at verse 13 and 15, these woes. Woe to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow others to go in. And you'll notice, by the way, if you're trying to keep track, verse 14 is hidden in a lot of manuscripts. And so uh, textual critics who try to understand what was the original manuscript think that verse 14 was added later and existed when the verses were made verses. But now as we try to understand the received text, we think it's not probably it. All right, so you got verse 13, then verse 15. Uh, what's the theme of verse 13? That the kingdom of heaven has been shut by the Pharisees and uh, those who even want to go in it, they make it even harder for them to get in. Verse 15. Again, there's a proselyte, someone who is a seeker of God. And they said, you work hard to make them a proselyte, but then once they are in your fellowship, you make them as much as twice as a child of hell as you yourselves are. So the theme is the kingdom of heaven being closed. Who has the power to close the door on the reign of heaven? And why do the Pharisees claim this authority? So who has the power to open and close the kingdom of heaven? It's God. God has the power to open and close. He, he'll tell his disciples um, after the resurrection, when he breathes on them the Holy Spirit, he says, whatever sins you forgive are forgiven, and whatever sins you retain are retained. The opening and closing of the kingdom of heaven for Jesus is found in those who are righteous, the door is open. For those who are unrighteous, the door is closed. So how does someone move from going through an open door that is for the righteous or being on the closed side for the unrighteous? How does that change happen between righteous and unrighteous? The Pharisees are going to see it happen, they think, by teaching someone the law. That by obedience to the law, a person will become righteous. But Jesus points out that in doing so, you in fact are um, closing the door of heaven. Because you are giving someone the vanity that they're going to be able to make their own way into the kingdom of heaven through their own obedience. And then verse 15, that idea of the proselyte. Someone is invited to know God. And then the Pharisees teach them to obey the law to know God. But in fact, we know God through his grace and mercy. So the first woes in verses 13 and 15 are about whether the Pharisees are opening heaven or closing heaven. Now let's look at the next set of woes, uh, verses 16 through 22. So this has this image of blind guides. Again, if they're trying to lead you to the kingdom of heaven, but they don't see it. And there's this uh, strong emphasis on oaths in this section. And he's asking them, by what, um, by what are your oaths made secure? How do you know your promises are secure? And so you'll see in each one of these balances, there is either the place where you make your oath off um, that is secured by God, or you'll see that they are securing the oath by what they are bringing to that place. So verse 16, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing you say, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by the oath. So God is the temple. God is the, the one who dwells. But they're saying the oath is made secure by the gold we bring. So you'll notice that Jesus is uh, showing a contrast between what is there versus what the Pharisees bring. The Pharisees are making the point that your oath is made secure by what sacrifices you make. But Jesus is going to point out that your oath is made true by what God brings. And this is going to be, in 16 through 22, the big flip between the Pharisees. You are something because of what you bring. And Jesus making the point, you are something because of what 
God brings. So the first one in verse 16 is the Pharisees say, it's not the temple, but it's the gold you bring to the temple. Verse 17, again, the emphasis on being blind, and now they're fools also. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? Which is more sacred, you or the one that makes you sacred? Who is the author of your life? Are you the one that writes your life or is God the author of your life? If you make the oath by you, what makes that strong and secure of an oath? It's only built on your own unrighteousness. If God is the one by which your oath is secure, think of this word oath as like your commitment to follow God. What makes your commitment to follow God something you can trust in? So the temple or the gold you bring. All right, that's verse 16 and 17. And verse 18, And if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing, you say. But if he swears by the gift that's on the altar, he's bound by the oath. Again, what makes your commitment important? Is it what you bring or is it what God brings? Verse 19, again, the emphasis on blind. Um, And he goes, what's more sacred, the gift or the altar? Then finally, verse 22, And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Now we get to what Jesus is aiming for. Your swearing, your, your oath, your commitment is built by the one who's on the throne, not by you. The one who sits upon the throne of God is the one who establishes you in the kingdom. That's uh, the struggle in these woes. All right, now we're looking at question 13. Verses 23 and 24, it says in our question study sheet, there is a danger when people get caught in smaller matters of piety at the expense of larger and more important truth. The purpose of the tithe was to support the priests and the Levites in Israel. The priests and the Israelites in the original distribution of land, they didn't get a specific inheritance. But everyone else who got a specific inheritance of land was supposed to tithe from their land to be able to support the work of the ministers, the priests and Levites. Some texts will also highlight that these tithes didn't just go to support the priests, but actually the ministry of the priests. And then that gets to what was the activity of the priests was not to enrich themselves, but so that they could be um, able to help the widows, the orphans, and the sojourners. We're going to read Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29 now. So let's turn there. So Deuteronomy 14. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall Eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you so that you will not be able to carry the tithe, when the Lord your God blesses you, because this place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses. Spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. You shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. And at the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of the hands that you do. All right, so this is the text that Jesus seems to be referring to when we look back at Matthew 23. Uh, So Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 to 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin have neglected the weightier matters. So mint and dill and cumin, um, put those on a scale, then put the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and father, faithfulness, The things you should have been doing that are weightier in the eyes of God, you have neglected because of the things that are easier to do. And then he makes this uh, image. You're straining out a gnat, but then you swallow the camel. Um, 
spend a little time ta uh, talking about now uh, the tithe. What were the people who brought the tithe supposed to do after offering it to the Lord? So we want to look now at Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 to 29. It says, You shall tithe the yield of your seed that comes from your field year by year. And before the Lord your God in that place, he will choose to make his name to other. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and of the firstborn. The first thing that they do with their tithe is they strengthen themselves. And they learn and trust that God is with them. And then they take that tithe and then they start to share it with the Levite. But if it's too far, then they turn it into money and they travel with the money and then they bind one, buy once they get there. And then you saw in verse 28, after every three years, you have to do a special tithe that goes to your own hometown. And so there is in this tithe an emphasis on securing yourself. Make sure you eat. Make sure you travel to support the ministry. And make sure you support your home. So the tithe was not meant to be something that allowed you to neglect yourselves. It wasn't supposed to be something that then give you permission to neglect the ministry of the Levites or priests. Nor was the tithe something that gave you permission to neglect the mercy that was needed in your town. So... Deuteronomy 14 is a reminder that the tithe was in service to justice and mercy and faithfulness. The tithe was not to be something you contrasted with the pious works that you do, but in fact, the tithe, that is, the giving of your resources, supported God's desire for justice and mercy and faithfulness in the land. Let's look at these woes now back in Matthew and see, is that what they're doing with the tithe? It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, clean the inside of the cup and the plate, then the outside may also be clean. Um, what is going on here is our another woe is going to be talking about... Um, the question of this cup and dish. Um, what was what, what's going on here? The Pharisees would clean things that had been touched by the outside world, so that they wouldn't be stained by touching something that had been in the world. So it says you clean the outside, but the inside you're neglecting. So if the idea is if I handed you a glass. Before you touch the glass, you'd wipe the outside of the glass. Because you wouldn't want to touch something that I had touched. Because I'm from the outside. But Jesus says they get so focused on making sure the outside is clean, they forget to pay attention to what's on the inside. They're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside, then you can worry about the outside. This woe is a little bit confusing, by the way, because uh, the big question is, what is Jesus referring to with the cup and the dish? In the previous four woes, Jesus has spoken about actual practices like do the dill, the cumin, um, the, uh, the shutting the kingdom of heaven. What is he speaking about? Is he talking about actual pot pottery or is he speaking metaphorically? The scribes and the Pharisees have attended to washings and rituals. And they even complain about how Jesus doesn't wash his own hands. Um, or how um, his disciples aren't honoring outside rituals. So it would seem that Jesus is speaking metaphorically. That he's taking these elaborate rituals they have for washing. Stuff that comes from the outside world before it's in their home. And he said, your elaborate external rituals are being done without thought of what's going on internally. How do we determine what is minor and what is major? When we look at what to focus on at, as a church, sometimes people will complain that the church is focusing on 
the small things and is neglecting the big things of the, the faithfulness, the righteousness, and the mercy of God. And other times we'll say, well, the small things add up, and that's the only way you get to a big thing is by doing the small things right. One way that we can know that we are focusing on what is minor and forgetting what is major is when we forget the purpose. What is the purpose of washing? Well, baptism. What's the purpose of baptism? Not actual washing of my body, but to wash the sins away. Why were the Pharisees dealing with the cups and the dishes that came from the Gentile world? Because they knew that the world was filled with sin. Do we know also our own world is filled with sin? Do we take care to repent of our own sin? Or do we just make sure we wash away our touch of other people's sins? All right, we're going to look at our next woe, uh, verses 27 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Although scribes and Pharisees were highly regarded, their opposition to Jesus has rendered them unclean. Leaders are not always what they seem and even what they may think of themselves. A terrible contradiction happens when leaders rely on hypocrisy to hold authority. The Pharisees have whitewashed their their outward actions and they've allowed their insides to become dead because no longer are they trusting in God but they're trusting on the hypocrisy the external masks of what people see there's in the news right now Ravi Sicarius uh, Ravi Sicarius is dead uh, but while he was living he was a highly uh, credible apologist for the Christian faith um, an Indian man a Christian traveling the world uh, on radio stations, on videos, uh, recorded so many times, talking about uh, the legitimacy of the Christian faith. Uh, towards the end of his life, people made accusations uh, that he was uh, a sexually immoral man. He declined these. He said they were slanderous claims. Um, after he died, an investigation has happened. Sadly, it turns out most of these claims against him, and the trend is to say they were true, um, whitewashed hypocrisy is so destructive to our Christian message. Uh, I know of people who are even wondering, uh, what do they do with books or videos that they have from Ravi Zacharias that would be seeming to say true Christian things? Um, do they keep them on their shelves? The Pharisees are so focused on the pretend of righteousness that they forget to trust that God is the one that's made them righteousness. This terrible contradiction of Christian leaders that speak one message but then live another. It's destructive. Why do people rely on lies to hold on to authority? When we make our strength, our might, our wisdom, the, the majesty, the glory that we are sharing, then we have to keep feeling, we have to keep propping up how perfect we are. Can we be honest in our deliverance of the good news that we ourselves are weak sinners? That's one of the things that makes the Gospels more authentic. The disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are weak, struggling men who need Jesus. It is amazing to think of the literature of the Bible and how it keeps overwhelmingly show the weakness of us frail sinners and the amazing, overwhelming love of God. The legitimacy of the Gospels as a witness to the truth is built up in the fact that the disciples don't make themselves sound so perfect. In your own Christian witness, continue to be humble, vulnerable, telling the truth about where sins and struggles happen. All right, let's look at our final woe. Uh, verses 29 to 33, the charge flowing through these woes has been that the warning about following blind guides um, that uh, now is the 
Pharisees are blind to their own sin. And they say that if we had been there, we would not have sinned like the people of old. And they try to wash their hands of the blood of their ancestors who had murdered the prophets. We may do this sometimes as well. And we may see the disciples or the crowds or the leaders and say, well, if I had been there, I would have followed Jesus. Jesus is reminding the Pharisees that you can't escape judgment just because you're in the future of history. We are sinners through and through. And if we turn away from arrogance and, and we, we just are willing to be vulnerable and say, I don't know what I would have done. I think it would have been hard. I would have struggled. I see Peter and I see his struggle. Or I see Nicodemus and how he comes in the night and he's afraid. If we can be vulnerable, then we can be willing to trust that God is our rescue and our salvation. All right, that concludes our Bible study of looking at chapter 23 and the woes, uh, the hypocrites, the warnings that are given to the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, I hope that in today's study, you got to see the need to be humble and to not exalt ourselves, but to be exalted by the glory of God. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Holy Father, I ask that you would be with me um, through your spirit to lead and guide me in wisdom and truth, that uh, I would seek not my own glory, but I would seek the glory that is found in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen. Have a wonderful, glorious day. I hope you are able to enjoy the wonder of the transfiguration and see that the clarity of seeing Jesus as the true God comes from hearing the voice of God.